Welcome to series two, lesson three. This is your first project. And the reason we do projects in this series is in order to introduce you to a number of the basic accessories and maybe some of the activities and some of the actions that you do in producing these. I'm worried on chapter three of the book and the goal here is to introduce you to what's called the four jaw scroll chuck, the Jacobs chuck, and a couple of other minor things. So what we're going to be doing is this project which starts on page 23 and it has two versions. It's a screwdriver project. So I went to the back of the book on page 94 and 95 and I find back here a table that shows me the material I have to cut. I needed a piece of wood for this two by two inches square by about seven inches long. Very little bit, but I got the information I needed from there. So there's two versions of the project and let me show you both of them and we're going to do the second of the two. And what we've done is gone to one of our discount stores, bought one of these plastic handled screwdrivers and cut the handle off. And this is what you're left with. A shaft and this little piece that carries all the components. There are two wings on the bottom of the shaft which holds it tightly into the plastic so I went to the grinder and ground those two off so that I have something I can stick into a round hole. And when you turn that, this is the kind of project to come up with, a screwdriver with a number of different bits. This requires us drilling one hole and making sure that this diameter right here is approximately the size of this piece of rubber so that it looks nice. Well, I'm not going to do that one. I'm going to do the more complicated of the two projects. And that's this one, also purchased from the same discount store. This gives you a six-way screwdriver, a shaft that can be taken out and reversed with um, small and large uh, bits on either end. So when you cut that plastic apart, you end up with this, which is fine, but the neck piece is hexagonal. Again, I'd like it to fit a round hole. So what I've done is gone to the grinder and simply ground that part till it's roughly round. We're going to epoxy that into place later on. So here's the bit. Here's the fitting. And when we get done, it's going to sort of look like this. I can take it out reversed. The tips can be taken out reversed. It gives us a lot of options. So some of the characteristics of a nice screwdriver. Number one, it needs to fit your hand. So the dimensions on turning this thing are, are actually established by you as you turn this. The second thing I suggest is that the end of this be rounded over because many times we hold a screwdriver like this. I don't want it to dig into your palm. So this I made because it uh, fits my hand. In fact, I brought this one from home. So we're going to make this project. Let me clear all this out of the way. And I want to show you the things we're going to be using today. A lot of stuff. Most importantly, I'm going to be introducing you to the four jaw scroll chuck. This is probably the first major accessory that you'll buy for your wood turning lathe. It has four jaws. They all close concentrically. And in fact, if I close it down about here, you can see that this actually forms a, a perfect circle. These jaws were made in one piece and then cut into quarters. So they're able to uh, close easily. It screws onto the headstock of your lathe. This black piece here can be exchanged for different pieces depending on the thread on your headstock lathe. So you buy this part separate from this and then set them up together. There's a lot of ways to use this to hold a piece of wood. We're going to show you one way today, and in a later video, in this same series, we'll show you another way to hold things using the four jaw scroll chuck. First major accessory. Second one is what's referred to as a Jacobs chuck. It has a Morris taper on this end, Morris taper two to fit our tail stock, and this opens and closes to capture and hold drill bits. So we're going to be drilling on the lathe using the tailstock and the Jacobs chuck to get proper 
concentricity. What's our second success rate? Well, to drill, of course we have to have drill bits. I need two different size drill bits. It's in the book. This one for forming one hole, and a second bit for forming a deeper hole. Now I've got tape on both of these. I've already marked how deep the hole needs to be. As you can see, two different things. This drill bit's fairly unique, and you can find these. This has a Morris taper on this end. In this case, with this drill bit, I can actually insert this directly into the tailstock and drill without the additional length of the Jacobs chopper. Generally, you find these in uh, machinist supply catalogs, but they are a standard twist drill bit and are very useful for us. So I need a chuck, ability to drill holes, and once I have the hole drilled in the wood, I want to go back to supporting the piece of wood between centers. One end is in the chuck, the other end, I'm going to use a different kind of live center, one that has a point that will fit down inside the hole that we've already drilled and hold it nice and centered that way. This is very good for when holes are drilled. By the way, this particular one here was fairly inexpensive. I purchased it from one of the discount uh, woodworking suppliers for under $20. A good accessory for many projects. So I'm going to use that. The trick is to see if it'll lay on the table without rolling off. Let's see, what else do I need? Well, as we did in the first two videos, I have to be able to take my piece of wood, find and mark the center, mark the center again by punching it. I'm going to clean the tapers on the lathe before I start with my little taper cleaner. I have my piece of wood cut two by two by seven, like uh, in the uh, instructions. And for finishing, this time we're going to do a little bit of sanding. So I've cut three strips of sandpaper. I like these cloth strips. They're cloth, they're very flexible. I can put them around a project very easily. I've got 180, I'm sorry, that's 120, 180. 220. I think that's going to be sufficient. And for a finish, I'm going to do the simplest we can. And I'm just going to put on an oil finish, raises the quality of the look, but it's very simple. And I'm using what's called uh, a walnut oil, and we'll burnish that till it's mostly till it's very dry when we get done. And this is a Mahoney's walnut oil. There's other brands. To burnish it and to clean up, of course, I need a little bit of paper towels. I like blue shop towels rather than the kitchen paper towels. They're a little softer. They're, um, I think, easier to work with and leave a better finish when I'm rubbing things onto a, a piece of wood. I think I might actually put a few decorations on. And to do that, I'm going to use a burning wire, something we've not done before, obviously. And to do that, I'm going to need to dig a small groove. And that will require me to use, again, my skew chisel, and with this tool, I'm going to show you the second of the many cuts that the skew chisel can make, and this is called a V cut, and I'll demonstrate that as we go through. So that's kind of where we're going to be going. So I'm going to put all this stuff back in the right order, step over to the wood lathe, and let's get the project started. Reset, be with you in a second. Okay, we're over at the wood lathe. And my first thing again is to clean the tapers. I think this should be a basic thing we do each time. Again, my Morris taper cleaner just to remove any debris from the last time this lathe was used. I don't know when that was and I don't know by whom, but I know that these are clean. It's out of the way. Second thing I'm going to mark up the center for my piece of wood. I cut this square. So if I went all the way around, I would expect, well, I cut it pretty close to being a square. It looks like I'm off of by less than a sixteenth of an inch, but that's close enough for woodworking. Mark the centers, put the pencil and the marker away, come back here with my punch.
and mark the two centers. Now, when I hold this on the lay this time, I'm going to do something a little differently. We're going to start with the four jaw scroll chuck. And the reason is, at some point, I need access to the opposite end of this project in order to drill a hole, which means I have to have a solid holding thing on this end. The uh, drive center is not adequate. Well, we have an insert here we know that matches this particular lathe, so I'm going to screw the chuck on. This is a one by eight thread, one inch diameter, eight threads per inch. And I don't want to do that because it's not a tight seat. So I'm going to take the last quarter of an inch and slam it on. Trust me, to get this off of here, I'm going to need mechanical help. I can't, I can't loosen it. That's good. So, because this piece of wood is its size, and I haven't rounded it, I'm going to grab it between the corners of the chuck, like that. That's just loose. I'm not going to tighten it too much yet. I'm going to take my regular live center, like the one we used last time, put it into here. Still squeaks. I'm going to come up here and find that punch mark. Now this piece is lined up, and I'm going to take my key and tighten the jaw. There are two holes here. I'm going to tighten one, tighten the other, and I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can move that key. That looks pretty good. So I'll set the key aside. I'm now going to lock my tailstock, bring it up snugly, lock the quill, and move my tool rest into that quarter inch that we talked about. I hope you're following all the lessons because when we talked about it, it was in the last lesson. Making sure that I'm clear. I'm also making sure that the end of the tool rest is clear from the four jaw chuck. I don't want it to run into this either. So my first tool of use will be the spindle roughing gouge because I just want to make this round. So. Let me get myself ready. Watch is off. Glasses are on. Running good and smooth. I set the speed before we started to shoot at 1800 RPM, so we're right back to where we were in the last lesson. So I'm going to rough this out, working towards the end. I think I'm going to prefer to do it with the left hand to keep me more in front of my project. I have to be cautious not to run into these metal jaws and my goal is just to get it generally round. Oh, I have a problem. You didn't probably see it on that camera. But I saw the tool rest move. It actually twisted a little bit. So it means that it was not locked as tight as I would like it. Went back and rechecked it. It seems solid now. But that was, that was a problem ready to happen. We caught it in time. So back to finishing my roughing cuts. to hear something. As I approach roundness, I'm eh, pretty close to it right now, the sound of this cut changes from a bump, 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 sounding like a, a outboard motor to a more smooth, steady sound. And that is hitting solid wood and no interruptions. So start listening to the sound of the wood as you cut it, and you'll begin to find out, are we round? Without having to do that sometimes. So let me finish this. Now, 
I didn't get all the way up next to the chuck because as I cut with this tool, laying like this, I'm worried about this running in there. Know that this tool can be rolled up on its side and I can get much more closely approaching this jaw without running into it. Uh, this is used a lot in furniture turning to get a round portion of a piece of furniture uh, connected to a square portion of a piece of furniture, the apron of a chair connected to a leg for instance. So I'm going to roll the tool on its side and continue roughing until I get just a little closer to the fore jaw. Chuck. Tool's on its edge. Now we got it round all the way up to here. As you see, it didn't leave a very smooth surface at the end, but I don't really much care. This is all going to get cut away in the long run. So we have the piece round, and now before I take any more mass away, I want to drill these holes in the end while I have the most mechanical support in the piece. So what I'm going to do now is put the tool away, remove my tailstock. This is staying tightly right where it was, and I'm going to extract the life center. By backing this up, I reach a point where it doesn't want to turn any farther. A little farther turn, a pin pushes this free. So this comes right on out. So that's out of the way. First hole I want to drill is going to utilize my Jacobs chuck. So I'm going to seat it. I'm going to take a small Forstner bit of the size necessary put it into my chuck. Tighten the jaws down. Move it up and the point of this intersects that live center hole. Now, I don't want to drill at high speed. Uh, the bit will heat up, the wood will heat up, wood expands because of any residual moisture and it could bind the drill bit, certainly burn inside the hole. So before I do anything, I'm going to reduce the speed on the lathe to its lowest setting. In this case, it's 500 RPM. So I come down here, move the belts to 500 RPM. Check everything's clear. Now I can see this end is not square, and I'll deal with that later. So now with this tool rest out of the way, tailstock is locked, the quill is unlocked, I'm going to advance this drill bit until I'm up to the pencil mark. I like to take little cuts and stop. The problem with drill bits is they will load up with chips, which will also cause them to bind. You can see them building up inside the portion of it right there. Back it out, clear the chips, finish the hole. Now I left a tag on here so that when it starts flapping in the wind I know I've reached the right spot. Okay, that hole's done. And I have another hole to drill. I'm going to extract this. And for the second hole, it has to go much farther down. And I'm using that Morris taper bit. Well, I have to get this out far enough that it will seat, and it's seated. This is going to go further down. Now it's a twist drill, which means it's going to extract the sawdust and the chips to some extent. But don't trust that because it still loads up.
We stopped the tape for a minute while I was drilling this hole. And the problem was that this drill bit started to slip in the tailstock. If this taper was perfect and clean, and this was perfect and clean, that would not have let go. What I discovered is through, let's just say, use over time, this taper has gotten a number of galls and marks on it from, let's say, improper use. And those have prevented it from seating and staying seated tight in here like it should. So the only thing I can do is to take the drill bit out, clean it, try to remove those gall marks from it, and go back to drilling again. So let's finish this hole. Hole's completed. There's still our sawdust building in the bit, but we're done with this. And now to extract it, like other Morris taper items, we just simply back off the tailstock. The pin will push this out. Now that we've seated it properly, there's the point where the pin is, a little bit of a turn, now it comes right out. So we have two holes. And the first larger hole is to seat this component in. The second hole, the deep hole, will allow the other bit to rest all the way down inside of here like that. So we have our holes ready. And now I'm going to put in the live center. It's a different one. This has a cone on it. And the purpose of this is to rest inside the hole and give us support. So now I'm down to shaping my screwdriver. The handle's going to be up here. I'm going to stop a few times and grab it to see if it fits my hand properly. But basically, I'm going to use our shallow fluted gouge for most of the cuts. Okay, let's go to work. Oh, what else do I have to do? I have to put the speed back up where we had it before. We're at the drilling speed of 500 RPM, which is not fast enough to do a good job of turning. So I'm going to go back up to 1800 RPM where we were before, and that is one, two, three on the pulley. Much better. So a little bit of shaping here. I'm using this gouge very much like I would have used the roughing gouge. I've got it at a fixed spot. You can see a clean portion on the side of the tool, which is where I'm cutting with. My hand is against the tool rest, and I'm cutting it down at a slight taper, and to make that taper work even better, I can turn the tool rest to monitor, to monitor that same shape. So as I ride my finger along the tool rest, it starts creating that taper. Right hand holds the tool against my side. Could I have done this with a roughing gouge? Yep. As many times, there are multiple tools that will do the same job. Now I'm just trying to come down to a pleasing size that suits me. And it's just repetitive cuts. Trying not to run into my life center. And I'm cutting from the left to the right, which is from the larger diameter to the smaller diameter, which is in spindle turning, what we refer to as downhill to the grain. And maybe just a little bit more. Now 
Now I think I want this not quite that tapered, so I'm going to make this a little smaller up here. And by using a piece of 7 inch wood, we give you plenty of stock to prevent you from having to go up against the four jaw scroll shock and still have a nice hand grip size. last cut I went a little slower because I wanted a better looking surface. I'm trying to decide if that's going to be about right for my hand. That, that feels pretty close. So I now need to bring this end down to something like round. I can't complete it because I've got to sand and finish and maybe decorate a little bit. But I'm going to turn a bead down on this end here. All that wood's got to go away. So I'm going to roll a bead, fingers on the right hand side, my wrist is free, first cut. Now the tool buried as far as it can go and I haven't finished the bead so I need to take some waste wood off of, from this side. So I'm going to come back and do an opposite bead just to remove material. I'll go back and do a little bit more over here. Well, I'll do it with the other hand. Now I'm going this way so my finger's on top now. Going really slow because I want to get kind of a nice look to it. All the way over on the side. I've rotated that full 90 degrees. So, that's kind of roughly right. I'm looking at the curve here to see if there's any spots I want to maybe take a little bit off of. Basically, it's pretty close. So, the next thing I need to do is do a little bit of sanding. Now this isn't down enough to part off, but when I pull this away, I've got to be sure that this isn't going to go moving on me. So I'm going to put the tailstock back in place. You got three grits of sandpaper, 220, 180, 120. So to sand, one of the other safety things we do is we remove the tool rest completely. Not just move it out of the way, but take it out. Now this paper can be used like this. You can do it underneath. If I sand underneath, the sawdust is moving towards you. So, if you're watching really close to the TV screen, be careful to put a dust mask on first. I can also put it over top, and by turning it at a slight angle, I can kind of blend away little marks that I may have left on there from shaping with the gouge. I'm going to do as much of the tail stock as I can, I mean the uh, end of the screwdriver as I can. That's uh, 120, 180. I always keep the paper moving. And one of the things we're going to do in one of our later lessons is do something where the surface is really going to be important. And that means turn the lathe off after you're sanding and sand by hand with the grain. What that does is take care of any of those little circular marks you might have put on with the sandpaper. If you don't keep the paper moving, you'll definitely get spiral marks. And so I try to keep it moving. Now that's removed a lot of them. Now I'm going to go to 220, do the same thing one more time. This is a screwdriver. I don't need it really, really smooth. I want to be able to grip it. 
220. Okay, now I'm going to show you something new. Second cut with the skew chisel is what's called a V cut. And we use it many times to set up for a decorative mark I'm going to do next. A V cut requires us to take the tool, stand it on this flat edge on the tool rest like this, so it's vertical. And that puts the long point on the bottom. And I'm simply going to roll the tool in. Now it won't go very far because this V-shaped uh, blade is going to bottom out. So I'm just going to leave a little bit of a V mark, and that's all I want, because it's going to lead me to put two or three decorative marks on this. Short point, the edge is round. Long point, the edge should be flat, and that allows us to keep this vertical. If this cocks off to one side, it's going to cut a nice spiral groove in about half a second. So I'm going to keep it here, I'm going to maybe make three, <coughs> excuse me, little tiny V cuts. One, two, three. Now, that's not much. And I can see it tore the grain and raised it up a little bit. That's okay. Because my next step, again, I'm going to remove the tool rest. I'm going to use a burning wire. This is just a piece of steel wire, not too uh, shiny. And with the lathe running at speed and me holding this down by the handles, I'm going to create enough friction that I'm going to burn a line in here. Always hold them by handles. If you have a piece of wire, you wrap it around your fingers, guess what will happen? Uh, you'll become a nine-fingered turner uh, pretty soon. So always have handles on your wire. I have several different sizes at home for different size burning lines I want. Guitar strings work really good because they're, they're wrapped and they, they create friction. Um, uh, fishing leaders used in sturgeon and so heavy duty fishing also works because it's wrapped and it creates a lot of friction. Anyway, there's a lot of different things you can use. So leave the speed up. I'm gonna reach over to the first uh, groove, hold it down, waiting for smoke. Off. Two, three. And I can do a little bit more in the center one. I want to make sure they all look about the same as best I can by eye. Now I'm going to go back to my 220 sandpaper because I've raised the grain and I've burned some of the wood. You can't see it, but there's a little bit of a yellow hue going on either side of that groove, which will be easily removed just like that. So we have a decorative handle. I'm going to take this down a little bit farther, as far as I can, and then I'm going to put finish on it, part it off, and then finish this very end by hand. So I want to do as little work on the end as I possibly can, making sure the tool rest is nice and tight, we're clear. I can come back here with my shallow fluted gouge and continue to take this down. I want it nice and round so it fits my hand. I'm clear. Take a little off the waist side first. Well, guess what happened on the waist side? Thank heaven, not on the work side. I came in here with the tool set at about a 45 degree angle. Of course, I grabbed it and pulled it back. I didn't have it all the way vertical like I needed to have. So now I'm going to check to be sure I do it right. And now I can open up the tool as I come down like a toe. Okay, I have more room to work to bring this down. Back to the left hand. I'll take this in stages, tightening the bead each time. The tool is all the way up on its side. And I'm not really happy with that bottom yet, but that's okay. Tool rest out. 
back to my 180 and 220 to sand some more of that area I just exposed. Shape's looking okay. 180. Okay, so we're down to finish. No, I don't mean complete. I mean add finish. And I'm going to use what's called walnut oil. Just happens to be something that goes on easily. Uh, it doesn't take much work. And I'm going to use a piece of blue shop towel, fold it up to apply it. Set the top aside so I don't lose it. <coughs> So I'm dribbling it on, rubbing it in with the uh, blue shop towel. Now if I just let this set, it'll take a little while to dry. It's a fairly porous wood, so it's going to soak up a lot. But basically, it's a simple finish. And I'm sure it's all rubbed in pretty well. But I want to take this home. And I like to put it on the car seat. Well, it's a little sticky. So what I want to do is burnish it. And burnishing it, I'm going to take dry paper, uh, shop towel, and I'm going to increase the lathe speed, and I'm going to put pressure against it until it gets warm. And that's going to set the finish. So that means I need more speed. So I'm at 18. Let's go up one more speed. On this lathe, it turns out to be 2700. It's the next step up. So there's 2700. And what I'm going to do is simply hold the paper towel on the bottom, and I'm waiting for my finger to get warm. And what that's going to do is set the finish. A lot of different finishes you can apply. The one of your preference is fine. See some of the oil coming off. My finger's getting kind of warm, and that's good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is good enough to take home now. It's clean, it's dry. Uh, the wood I've used here again, by the way, is poplar. It's an inexpensive, uh, kind of porous, soft, hardwood. Um, so you can take your best hardwood and make a really nice looking handle anything will do. So now I need to park this off. You can come in here with a scroll saw, uh, a Japanese pull saw and cut this and then hand sand that in. That works really great. We can use our parting tool to take that off, which is probably what I'm going to do today. I'm going to park towards this side, not cutting right down to the end because what will happen is it will pull out a few fibers. And I don't want those fibers below the surface. I'd rather sand off a little extra wood than have a hole in there that uh, doesn't look good. So I'm going to get my parting tool out wherever it is, probably down here. I'm going to put the tool rest back in because I need to rest it. I'm going to bring it up here relatively close. Now the parting tool is thicker this way than the gouge I was just using. So to reach the center, I'm going to have to put the tool rest a little lower locked. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So now, if I cut this off with this in here, it's going to bind between these two pieces and go flying. So I'm going to kind of lightly hold it with this hand. Use my thumb against the parting tool to guide it. I'm cutting with my left hand. And I'm at 2700. From the, I want to take it back down to where I was, down to my 100 RPM. That's just one notch down. This is sanded. I'm not grabbing it. My fingers are resting very lightly around it. 
my thumb is out here to support. And I'm not going to push really hard, I'm going to take my time. And I'm not right at the end of the piece. As soon as we part off, you'll see what I mean. When you get down towards the center, the one's not moving very fast. So it's going to take a little while to get through it. By the way, there's no drama when you finally cut through. I'm already done. The piece is already come up. It basically just stops turning. So, what we have now to do is we have this little nubbin on the end that needs to be sanded away, carved away in some way to complete the handle, which I'll do that off camera. And then, this component gets glued into here and we're done. So, screwdrivers, we'll clean that up later, is a good introduction project. It's allowed us to start using the forge off scroll chuck for the very first time. It's allowed us to use a different style of life center to be supported in that hole. It allowed us to introduce you to the Jacobs chuck, which can be driven from the tail stock, and even a type of drill bit that fits right into the taper itself. So and I know this is something that you might not get, but the first thing you're going to buy as an accessory probably will be a four jaw scroll chuck suitable for your lathe. At the same time, or very shortly thereafter, you'll probably buy one of these because several of the projects we're going to show you require holes being drilled, and this is the easiest way to drill a hole that is concentric to the rotation of the shaft. So in our next lesson, we're going to introduce you to another way of holding things on the chuck. We did it between centers. We've introduced the four jaw scroll chuck. And we're going to now, in the next lesson, introduce you to a collet chuck system. Hope you're following along, trying some of these projects. We'll see you in the next lesson.